What is the Rescorla Wagner model and how does it explain classical conditioning? Stay tuned. Here at Psy vs. Psy, we can't wait for October. We've got a whole line of videos on theme for the season featuring the creepy, the weird, and the unexplained. Uh, this just sounds like our regular content. Consider subscribing so you don't miss the cool stuff we have planned. Even though it's still September, I thought today we'd tackle one of the scariest topics in the field of learning. One that can bring the toughest of psychology students to their knees. Something so frightening that dozens of students change their majors when they see it for the first time. I'm talking, of course, about the Rescorla Wagner model. Before you wet your pants and call the priest, let's see if we can take a look at this monster and see that it's not really all that scary. Now, a quick note, this video is really tough without assuming a little bit of background knowledge. There may be a couple of things about classical conditioning that could probably use deeper discussion, but hopefully we'll be okay without getting too far off track. So let's start with a brief overview of classical conditioning. Remember Pavlov's dogs? Pavlov played a sound every time he gave his dogs food, and the dogs quickly learned that the sound was a signal for the food. This caused a new behavior to emerge, such that the dogs began to salivate when they heard the sound, something they didn't do initially. Now, I'm here in Tejas, and I can tell you the same thing happens with Tex-Mex restaurants. When I roll through the radio dial in the car and hit a Tejano station, I have the sudden urge to find a burrito. The cool thing about classical conditioning is that it's applicable to so many situations. This means that we can talk about it in an abstract way, using symbols to stand in for the individual parts. The stimulus that elicits a natural response, such as food causing salivation, we call an unconditioned stimulus, and the response is an unconditioned response. The stimulus that's being learned about is the conditioned stimulus, and the response that is learned is called the conditioned response. Now lots and lots of things could serve as a US and as a CS. Whether you're learning to associate Taco Bell with stomach pain, uh, a certain perfume smell with that special someone, or a tone that's associated with a food pellet. In all cases, the pairing of that meaningful US with the neutral CS results in a change in conditioned responding. Almost always, we're measuring the change in conditioned response as learning occurs from trial to trial. So in Pavlov's case, how much do the dogs salivate when the sound is presented? At first, the conditioned response, or CR, is low, but the more they learn, the more they salivate. Now, there are things you can do to make classical conditioning go faster or slower. For example, if you make the sound really loud, it might be more attention-getting and therefore result in faster learning. Likewise, if you deliver a bigger reward, like bacon strips rather than dog kibble, the dogs might learn even more quickly. This tells us that one of the things that we need to keep in mind is the intensity of the CS and the US, which are likely to impact the rate of learning. For a little nuance, nuance. This is usually captured in a more complex idea called salience, which includes not only the size of the reward, but also how appealing it is and so on. But I'm trying so hard to stay on target here, so maybe future video? For now, when you see the word salience, just think of it as how attention getting the CS and US are. If you get really sick from eating Taco Bell, you're going to learn to avoid it faster than if you only got just a little bit sick. Whew, that was a lot. But now we're ready to talk about the Rescorla Wagner model. Wouldn't it be really cool if we could come up with a formula that explains how classical conditioning works? And maybe this kind of formula could make interesting or unexpected predictions that we could then investigate and verify. Robert Rescorla set out to do just that. If you're unfamiliar with him, he was a juggernaut in the field of learning, one of the most influential scholars in the field. Alan Wagner was no slouch either, so when they put their heads together, they came up with a really simple and elegant way to mimic the kind of learning you see in classical conditioning using really basic math. Trust me, it's not as complicated as it looks. Now, they published this idea in a book chapter in 1972, and it's been used to torture young psychology students ever since. Okay, so what does it do? The Rescorla-Wagner model simulates how much is learned on each 
training trial. And the formula is run each time the CS is presented. So let's unpack some of the pieces of this formula to help it make a little bit more sense. We have delta V equals alpha times beta times lambda minus V. And that looks complicated, sure. But that's just because we haven't explained what all these symbols mean. So let's start with lambda. Lambda is the maximum stable conditioned response that you could get in this situation. Lambda sets the boundaries of what you could possibly learn. So for example, if you feed a rat five pellets, it might be willing to press the lever 20 times to get those five pellets, right? So it's, it's the stable level of responding that you see. Now to keep it really simple, we can say that the max we could learn is 100%. So we can assign lambda a value of one. Now, when you're playing around with these numbers, you can assign it to anything else, but just to keep things simple, let's call it one, 100%. If the trial wasn't rewarded, the maximum CR that you would expect is none, none CR. So in that case, lambda would be zero. You don't expect any behavior. So lambda is determined by the US. A larger US gives you a larger lambda. No US gives you a value of zero. But for our purposes, let's just start with a value of one and we're not gonna change that for a while. Next, let's talk about V, which symbolizes the associative strength or how much is learned between the CS and US. So how much do you currently know about the CS? If you've never learned anything at all, V is zero. There's no association between the CS and US. If I know the CS and US are connected with a high degree of certainty, then there's nothing left to learn. For simplicity, we can call this 100% learning by giving it the value of one. So V, the possible strength of the association between the CS and US, ranges between zero and lambda, or in our case, zero and one. So we know as we learn, we go from zero to a maximum of one. The thing we're trying to figure out is on any given learning trial where a CS and US are paired together, how much do you learn about the CS and the US? So if I go to Taco Bell for the first time and get a little bit sick, how fast do I connect the dots that it was actually Taco Bell that was making me sick? This first term, delta V, describes exactly that. It describes how much was learned on this one trial. So this is the thing we're solving for each time we go through the formula. It's the one thing that we don't know. The other variables are all known to us every time we go through the trial. So you could think of this as the change in condition responding or the CR. Every time we have a new trial, we're gonna get a new delta V. And since delta V is the change in associative strength, after each trial, we need to add our delta V to the total associative strength or V. If I start with a V of zero, but I learn a little bit and get a delta V of 0.1, delta means change. So I'm just changing my total V now by 0.1. V is the total associative strength and delta V is how much it changes on this one trial. Okay, finally, we need to talk about alpha and beta. In the original paper, they only mentioned beta, so you may see some differences here depending on your formula source. Remember how we said that the salience of the CS and US could impact learning? This is here to account for that finding. If I'm at death's doorstep after Taco Bell, I'll learn not to go back much faster than if I just get a minor tummy ache. The good news about alpha and beta is that they're unlikely to change in the typical classical conditioning experiment. That means we can just keep them at a constant number. Now, larger numbers should result in faster learning than lower numbers, but let's pick a number kind of right in the middle between zero and one. Let's pick 0.5. And this won't change throughout our examples. Okay, so let's see what happens on a few learning trials. Before I go to Taco Bell, how much do I know about the CS, Taco Bell, and the US, illness? Well, it's my first time, so I don't know anything yet. On the first trial, I'm gonna go to Taco Bell and I order a Crunchwrap Supreme and a Doritos Locos Taco. Therefore, my starting V between Taco Bell and illness is zero for this trial. Let's say the max I could learn is 100%, so lambda is one. 
will keep the intensity of that illness and the intensity of the Doritos Loco Taco constant at 0.5. So now we just have to solve for delta. Remember your order of operations. So we need to do the parentheses first. So lambda minus V is one minus zero, which equals one. Now we multiply that by our constants, 0.5, and we get our delta V for this trial is 0.5. On this trial, our associative strength changed by a positive 0.5. So our new V is 0.5, and I can plot that learning on a graph. Nice. Okay, that wasn't so hard, was it? Kind of fun and showed that I learned a little bit. Oof, I wonder if that Taco Bell did me in. So let's see what happens when I go back to Taco Bell for trial two. I order the same thing, and Lambda hasn't changed. Now my V is different though. My total associative strength starting out is now 0.5 because of that first trial. So this time when I solve, I get Lambda minus V is one minus 0.5 which is 0.5. Now I multiply that times my constants, 0.5, and I get 0.25. So this time the change in associative strength on this trial, delta V, is equal to 0.25. Now I've got to add that to my total associative strength, so the new total V is 0.75. And now let's graph it. On trial two, I learned something but not as much as I had learned on that first trial. Now let's go through it one more time. This time it's a lambda of one minus a V of 0.75, which gives me 0.25. Multiply by the constants and you get 0.125 change in uh, associative strength on this trial for a total of 0.875. If we keep doing this, we're gonna learn less and less each trial, but we're getting closer and closer and closer to one. Now, if we get to one, then we aren't gonna be learning anymore, right? Because one minus one is zero, multiplied by the constants, you get zero, and so you're not learning anything new. Look at this nice learning curve. Okay, so that's what happens in acquisition when you're pairing a CS and a US together. That's when the behavior is rewarded or reinforced in some way. But what happens if we look at extinction, where you present the CS, but the US is no longer present? So let's say that I've learned that Taco Bell makes me sick. So my V is at one. However, Taco Bell corporate develops a vegan sour cream, and this recipe change means that I won't get sick anymore. This means that Lambda has now changed. The maximum condition response you would expect should now be zero if I'm not getting sick. So let's see what happens. On extinction trial one, lambda is zero, minus V of one gives us a negative one. Multiply that by 0.5, the constants, gives us negative 0.5. We add the delta V from this trial, negative 0.5, to our total V of one, and now our new V, associative strength, goes down to positive 0.5. If we repeat this process, zero minus 0.5 is negative 0.5. Multiply that by 0.5, that's negative 0.25, which we add to our total V, and it goes down to 0.25. Now, if we keep repeating this process over and over and over again, our V will get smaller and smaller and smaller until it approaches zero. It doesn't matter much whether the CR is salivation in response to a sound paired with food, a tone paired with shock, or whatever classical conditioning situation you might come across. The Rescorla-Wagner model does a good job of explaining how you would get a gradual increase in learning up to a point in acquisition and down to zero in extinction. And really, the exact numbers don't matter so much when you plug into this formula. The pattern of results you get is the same. Rescarla Wagner does more than that though. It can account for a surprising number of other classical conditioning phenomena. I don't wanna to get too far into the weeds here, but there are a bunch of variations on classical conditioning and any theory trying to explain it will have to account for these things. Things like blocking and latent inhibition, the US pre-exposure effect, and so on. Rescorla Wagner does a pretty good job of explaining some of these, such as blocking and the US pre-exposure effect, 
And for such a simple procedure, it's amazing how well it works. It even made predictions that hadn't ever been expected before, which turned out to be true, such as the over-expectation effect. Now this is where you train two CSs separately with the same US. If you present them together, you get a stronger condition response than you would get with either CS alone. For example, if both Taco Bell and Arby's make me sick, and an office party orders from both places, I might expect to be twice as sick, even though I've never been that sick before. The V for Arby's and the V for Taco Bell add together to get a really big condition response. Rescorla Wagner isn't perfect, however, and there are things it can't explain. It especially has trouble explaining examples where there is learning in the absence of a US, such as latent inhibition and sensory preconditioning. Now, I don't mean to gloss over these fancy $10 terms, but this video is long enough as it is. If you want a follow-up video more in depth on this, let me know and I'll see what I can do with a part two. As for videos we already have, by the way, Rescorla Wagner can't explain cases where CSUS relevance or belongingness matters, as was the case in our video on John Garcia's taste aversion experiments, which I'll link to below. Even though it can't explain it all, it was a simple and elegant solution to describe many learning phenomena, and it made new predictions that help us advance the field of learning. And for that, on a scale of three to nine and a half, I give it a solid 10. Special thanks go out to our longtime subscriber Camille for the video idea. If you found this video helpful, help us back and hit that like button down there. If you have an idea for a video, leave a comment below. Subscribe for more content on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. I've really got to stop going to Taco Bell.